Once upon a time, there was this laddie, and he fancied himself as a wee bit of a wandering minstrel. He went from place to place, playing the pipes for a wee bit of food and somewhere to rest his head at night, which was all very well in the summer time, but in the winter time, well, he found himself up in the healings, and oh, it was, it was half it, half it called, and there was the end particular day, it was that frosty that the white rime that ran across the grass, the fields, and the hills never melted. While he was walking along this road, and he happened to see this dead body in the ditch, which that didn't really bother him, and he would have just walked right by. But the thing is, this body was wearing the grandest pair of bits, far better than he was wearing himself. So he thought to himself, oh, I'm going to have the bits. So he warmed up his hands. And he thawed out the laces, and he pulled the knots out and both of the bits, and then he tried to pull the bits off, but they wouldn't budge. Well, he happened to have a tool bag with him, so he went into the tool bag, and he brought out a hammer and chisel, and he worked all round about, and then he tried to pull the bits off, but they still wouldn't budge. So he went back into the tool bag, and he pulled out the saw, and he started to... <laughs> and the same way the other bit as well, he tied the laces together and he slung them round his neck. Then he went on his way. Well, of course, the days are short in winter time, and he thought, oh, he'd better get somewhere to rest his head at night, particularly again how cold it had been that day. And the only place he could see in that district was a firm that happened to be sitting on top of a hill. So he went up there and, uh, well, he walked up the garden path towards the house and he was just about to knock on the door when he minded the bits that he had round his neck. So he lifted them off and he, he slung them down a hint of bush and then he knocked on the door. Well, there was this old couple and they answered the door. And so he asked if, if they had anywhere they, where he could rest his head at night. And the old fellow says, no, I didn't think so. He says, how do you mean? He says, well, you're a stranger about here. We didn't ken you for Adam, so no, you're not getting to bide here. Well, the fellow was fair shocked. The piper was fair shocked because, I mean, it wasn't exactly the law, but it was, Healand hospitality was famous the world over. If you were travelling um, and you stopped at the last house, they were more or less obliged to take you in. So the piper says, oh, but come on, you know I'll be, I'll be frozen to the marrow, never to the marrow. Well, no, no, you're not getting to bide here, no getting to bide here. Well, he pleaded and pleaded, and finally the old fella says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do, you can sleep in the byre alongside the coo. And the piper's thinking, sleep in the byre alongside the coo. But he realised that this was the best he was going to get. So he says, oh, thanks very much, thanks very much. Well, the old couple went in, and the piper made his way down the path and he picked up his bits again, slung them back round his neck and he walked across the steeden and he walked into the byer. And right enough, there was a, there was a muckle brown coo kneeling down in the straw. Well, the piper was fair tired. He tained the bits for round his neck and flung them down and they landed next to the coo's head. Well, the piper laid his cell down and covered himself up in straw and he, f he was out for the coot, just like that. It was some time in the middle of the night where the piper woke up to the sound of the coo chowing away at the straw. And he thought to himself, maybe they bits have thawed out by now. So he got himself up and he went over to the coo. And be it so happened the coo had been breathing on the bits all night, so they were nice and warm. So he was able to take the bloody stumps of the feet out and then he tried the bits on. And do you know that they were the perfect fit? And what's more, they were nice and warm because of the coo's breath as well. So he was, he was fair chuffed, he was fair tooled. Well, he was a tidy kind of fella, so he tamed the bloody stumps of the feet and he put them in his odd bits and he tied them up and he left them next to the coo. Then he lay cell down, covered himself up in straw again and fell fast asleep. 
Well, it was about five in the morning when the old wife was padding across the steeding with two pails to go and milk the coo, and she was whistling a tune or something, and she walked into the byre. Oh my God! The coo's at the piper! The coo's at the piper! Geordie, Geordie, you need to come and see this! The coo's at the piper! Ah, oh, what's this now, old woman? What's this? What's this? It's so early in the morning for your nonsense. But Geordie Kent, he was on a hiding to nothing that he would have to come and see it just for a wee bit of peace. And so he entered the buyer. Oh my God, the coo's at the piper! The coo's at the piper! What did I tell you, Geordie? What did I tell you, Geordie? Well, never mind that woman. Let us think, let us think, because... If folk get to find out about this, we'll not get to bide with decent folk on him there. We'll get deported to Australia. Because that's what happened in the days. Well, through all this, the piper didn't stir. He was soon asleep. And the old man and the old woman decided to take the pick and the shovel that was in the corner of the buyer, take the bloody stumps of the feet and the boots, and go away and try and find some corner of the fern to kind of hide the evidence. The piper, he slept on, he slept on for about another three hours, something like that at least, and then he stirred, and he thought, oh, I need to just play the pipes just to, just to clear my lungs, clear my lungs. So he started playing the pipes. Round about the same time, the old couple were making their way back to the house, fair wabbit. They'd just come over the last field, had just started slimming over the fence when they heard the sound of the piper, the pipes. Geordie, do you hear what I hear? Aye. And the next thing they saw was the piper walking round the corner, looking all the world like a ghost. Of course, he's all covered in stew for the straw. Well, you should have seen that old couple that just leaped over that fence and ran over the field faster than you would have thought possible for an old couple like them. As for the piper, he never stirred the hair, he just kept on playing the pipes, marched across the steeding, marched up the garden path, and he was just finishing off his tune just as he got to the door. So he opened the door and he went in. There was a nice glow in the grate, so he taken a poker and he got a bit flame gone. Then he went through to the kitchen and he found in the pantry a muckle chicken there, cooked. So he, he cut a whole, whole chunks of it for himself and piled it onto a plate and then he came through and he happened to spy the bottle of whiskey sitting on the sideboard. So he helped himself to a muckle tumbler of that. And he sat down, he sat down next to the fire and he started having a grand feed and a grand drink to himself. And then he had a wee bit of a, a chuckle to himself, he thought, serves them right, serves them right for no putting a body up at night, serves them right. Now, that old couple, they've never been heard tell it again. And as for the piper, he's still biding in this house to this very day. However, there is another ending to this story that I was telling you once upon a time. As the piper was sitting at the fire, tucking into his dinner, there was a knock at the door. So the piper got up and he answered the door, opened the door, and there, standing there, was a, a, a man with an awful white face, shivering. So the piper says, Come away in, come away in and warm your feet. And the man at the door says, Well, I would warm my feet if I had any feet to warm. <laughs> <laughs>